God of the universe, we give thanks for the ukuleles and waves that break in beautiful sunny days and all of the grace that we have to give thanks for. Amen. The breeze is blowing off the lake this morning. The waves are waving at me. Oh, yeah. Sunday morning, Zach and I have been doing a little theological grappling about what baptism means and what it doesn't mean, and uh, so what we're going to do is rather than have Zach preach, we'll have me preach, uh, we're each going to take seven and a half minutes, and during that time we're going to offer what to us are the most important insights or thoughts uh, on baptism, and hopefully will help us think about it. Uh, we'll flip a coin first to see who gets to go first. And we're also not telling each other what the other guy is writing or saying. So that should be uh, an interesting service. Also, I uh, want you to know, uh, you've heard, if you're part of our church or in the community, you've heard about Net Gain 2017. A uh, basketball game we held a couple weeks back between Lake Forest High School and uh, Orr High School. Uh, we were inspired uh, to do that based on a story, a series of stories written by Rick Tellender. Well, we weren't the only ones who read those uh, articles and features in the Sun-Times. Uh, the folks at NBC did. So tonight on Megyn Kelly at 6 o'clock, uh, there will be uh, a feature 
uh, telling the story of the Orr High School uh, basketball team and their extraordinary coach, uh, Lou Adams. And uh, it'll give you some insight, uh, I think, into why we as a church family want to go the extra mile uh, to support this uh, extraordinary coach and the young men who he uh, dearly loves and, and coaches each week. So that's tonight. This morning's scripture comes from Acts 5 through 12, uh, 5, 12 through 16, uh, with the title, The Apostles Heal Many. Now many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's porch. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high honor. And more than ever, believers were added, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and the pallets, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So if you are someone who's come to the community church for the last almost 19 years, the passage Zach read uh, has never ever been read in our church. And here's how it came about, it's the sort of theme for this morning's worship service. Uh, a week ago, uh, I was in uh, Delaware uh, to preach in a worship service for Edwin Estevez. Edwin is a guy who was here a couple of years ago, and that Ken and I have been involved in helping him start a church in Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, to everyone's surprise, it's gone really well, and this church is happening. And so, he was nice enough to ask me to come preach. And so, uh, as it turns out, uh, they have, uh, their service was rained out. Um, they have it outside, but uh, not in a nice shelter like this, so I never ended up preaching. But what did happen was that in the process of that, he asked me if I'd come preach. I said, sure. I thought it would be awesome because it would be a Sunday. I didn't have to write a sermon. I could pull one out of the file that the folks in Wilmington had never heard. And I sort of have a break that week. And then about a week before the service, Zach said, well, we're, or not Zach, but sorry, but Edwin said, you know what, uh, we're doing this series on healing. And so I'd really like you to preach on Acts chapter 5. Well, nothing came to mind except I knew it was about the start of the early church. And so I said, of course, no problem. Then I looked at the passage, and I realized why I had never preached on it before, and as I researched it, why very few preachers in the world had ever preached on it, it's because it tackles this question of healing. And for me, the big question is, why is it that 2,000 years ago, Peter, and here I can see my shadow right now, Peter has such power that they can take people with all kinds of maladies, diseases, psychological diseases, everything, lay them in the street, and his shadow passing over them was enough for them to be fully healed. Not just a few of them, but all of them. How is it and why is it that that happened 2,000 years ago? And we're supposed to be, read about it and be inspired by it in the Bible. Yet in my experience, and my guess your experience, that's not what happens for us today. How are we supposed to think about that? And so it's a really challenging question, and it's what we tackle today. By the way, I told Edwin, if he ever comes to preach at our church again, which after signing this to me, he may not, I told him that uh, he's going to have to preach on uh, the seven-headed beast in the book of Revelation. <laughs> So, my relationship with God and healing goes back 50 years plus, and trust me, that's not something to brag about. It began when I was a child, and I had a sweet tooth. Not the kind of sweet tooth that could be fixed with a Snickers bar or a Hershey bar or a 
a Milky Way or a pack of M&Ms. I was kind of a, a, an addict who needed to mainline sugar. And so that means that I'd go into the refrigerator and reach in and get that dark brown can of Hershey's syrup, drink right out of it. It meant that the sugar bowl that was on our dining room table, I'd take the little cute top off and the spoon that was always in there, and I'd get a heaping spoon full of sugar, not to make the medicine go down, but just because I love the taste, and I didn't understand it back then, but I really liked the buzz, I'm sure. And I'd put that in my mouth and get every little bit of sugar out. And then, of course, being too young or too stupid to realize, you know, that putting it in my mouth would get the moisture from my mouth all over the spoon, and then I'd put the spoon back in. <laughs> And a few hours after that, I hear my mom, Tom, have you been eating out of the sugar bowl again? And depending on what frame of mind I was in or how old I was, I'd either fess up to it or I'd try to blame my older brother or younger sister. Now, when you are sort of an addict in any area, you usually have to pay the price. And the price that I paid for mainlining sugar and Hershey's syrup was I would end up with the most intense stomach ache you could ever imagine. On my side, curled up kind of like a shrimp on the back bathroom floor. And I was crying physically, and I was also at times crying out to God, oh God, please take this tummy ache away and I had a measure of confidence as I prayed to that God because I'd learned in Sunday school that God was a God who heals us. And then I also had a little bit of a strategy and I know that some of you have done this. When you're, when you're praying for something, a healing or something you really want, then you start bargaining, right? Oh God, I promise I'll be a good boy. God, I promise I won't say any more swears or bad words. Just take my stomach ache away. Well, I'm not sure if God didn't hear my prayers, if God was busy with other sorts of things, or if God didn't have the ability to heal me. I do know that when I was eventually freed from that pain, it didn't seem like it had anything to do with God. So despite that auspicious beginning with healing and with God, Throughout the course of my life, my relationship with God has healed, has continued. Because isn't that part of the story, a big part of the story we hear as children and even as adults? That God came to the world in the life of a man named Jesus who was someone who had kind of superhero powers to heal now, as an aside, lest you think that I'm the only crazy minister in town, another unnamed minister at their church uh, last month had a superhero Sunday. And they invited everyone in the church, children and adults alike, to come dressed to worship as their favorite superhero. So, we've never asked you to do that. But, we kind of portray Jesus as a superhero, right? There's a blind man. He's blind his whole life. He's never seen a thing. And what does he do? He reaches down into the dirt, gets some dirt, he spits into his hand, he mixes it up into a little bit of mud. This is in the Gospel of John. He takes that and he places it over the man's eyes, this mixture of spit and dirt, and the man's able to see. He's healed. And Jesus goes to Lazarus, who is dead. And he brings him back to life. The ultimate healer. And lepers are cleansed, healed. Deaf people can hear. They're healed. Jesus is God's ultimate healer. That's what we learn as children and adults as well. And then we start to grow up. And when we're teenagers, we begin to use the education we've been blessed with and we start to think critically. And we say, you know, these supernatural miracles 
don't seem to make sense to me. It's not the world that I experience. And we look back at passages like Acts chapter 5 and say, you know what? This isn't happening in the world. What's this story about? Is it the addition of a monk in the 3rd or 4th century to the Bible? And so, with Acts chapter 5, we have no idea what to do with it. Those supernatural feelings don't seem to occur today. And so, we take this, this healing in Acts chapter 5, which no matter how you look at it, is about pure, unadulterated, miraculous, supernatural healing. As Zach read, the sick were carried into the streets, lying on wooden pallets and beds, and the very shadow of Peter was enough for them to be healed. And then it goes on to say that people came from all towns around Jerusalem, even those people with unclean spirits. That's their way of saying people who had a mental deficiency, people who were crazy. And all of them, every single person, no matter what kind of healing they had, they were healed. So not only does Peter's shadow do it, but every kind of disease is taken care of. And it's not just a handful of people who get healed. Everyone gets healed. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? If I read Acts chapter 5, and that's how I'm supposed to think about God, or how we're supposed to think about God, it seems to me that God is A-W-O-L in the year 2017. Because that kind of stuff isn't happening. When was the last time any of us heard about a mass healing where everyone is healed just like that, or because they were in the shadow of someone? Most of us know someone who's experienced a wonderful, maybe miraculous healing. That certainly occurred in my life, but in no way, shape, or form like the stories told in Acts chapter 5. So what do we do with that? Stay tuned. Thank you. 
as it did 2,000 years ago. I thought about this no small amount and I believe that faith is personal. That means that every one of us has to do the work. That you can't have someone hand you a list of four spiritual laws and you say that prayer and then you're golden and that's it that uh, in my experience there's no small amount of struggle to get to a place where faith is meaningful. And so the solution that I've come up with to this question uh, may not be right for you, but it, it fits for me. This question of how do we think about God and healing and the fact that it, there's a big gap between what used to happen in Acts chapter 5 and what happens today. And the solution I've arrived at is this. After a lifetime of struggling with questions that I could live my entire life and never have the answer to, questions like, how is it that people merely go in the shadow of Peter and they're healed no matter what their problem is? Or how is it that Jesus could have the ability to walk out on water out to that sunfish right now. How did that happen? And why doesn't it happen today? Or how is it that a young teenage virgin like Mary is able to get pregnant and have this child who changes the world? The solution I came up with when it came to dealing with those questions I don't think I'll ever have the answer to or any of us will is this. I gave up trying. I gave up trying to answer unanswerable questions. I didn't give up faith. I just gave up trying to answer those questions that no matter how long I lived, I never have the answer to. For a long time, I was concerned that that was some sort of intellectual cop-out. That if I didn't have a good theological reason or answer, that I was just sort of being intellectual lightweight. Like, why couldn't I figure out the deal with why God acted that way then, but not today? And the reason I don't think it's an intellectual cop-out is this. If I knew the answer to how Jesus walked on water, if I had a sense of how Mary could be a virgin and have a baby, or how a boatload of people lying in the street on wooden pallets could all be healed by Peter's shadow. If I knew the answer to every one of those questions, it wouldn't change my faith in any sort of material way. Why? Because my faith at this stage of the game is really quite simple. It's about following the way of Jesus, seeking the things he sought and being open to the spirit and the ways in which God is involved in my life and in the world today. Period. End of story. That's it. If I had the answers to those questions, that would be interesting. But it wouldn't have anything to do with being the person who God has called me or God has told you to be. The beauty of this and the reason why making that decision is the best thing that's happened to my faith in the last 25 or 30 years 
is because the focus of faith is not on trying to figure out those things that are hard to understand. The focus of faith is on those things that I can do and that we can do. Which leads to this closing thought on feeling. It seems to me that if we give ourselves permission to ask the question, why doesn't healing occur nowadays like it used to? I think we also have to ask this question, how does healing occur in the year 2017? How does healing occur in the year 2017? And I don't think it happens when televangelists walk up to someone, whack them in the side of the head, say heal, they fall back into a group of thugs who help them off the stage, and then they ask you to send money. I don't think that's how God feels in 2017. I also have not experienced people standing in the shadow of the Pope or the Dalai Lama or some other spiritual rock star, and suddenly they're healed. All of us have experienced a person or two who has had a miraculous healing, but not like we hear about in Acts chapter 5. How does healing occur in 2017? Healing occurs when you and I have the courage and the faith and the strength to roll up our sleeves and do God's work. And it happens when we have open hearts and open minds and we pay attention to the world in which we live and when there when we see brokenness or wounds or injustice or inequality or disease or imbalance or pain or hatred those are all opportunities for God's healing that happens through us. And God is involved because the Spirit is in our lives inspiring us and driving us. So, the amazing thing is that in some ways, though it's easy for we people of faith to read the Bible and say, well, this doesn't make any sense, this doesn't happen anymore. Guess what? Since it's changed, since Jesus is no longer healing people, or the apostles are no longer healing people the way they did, the healing that's occurred when responsibility for it has been handed over to us is more profound and farther reaching than healing has ever been. Think about what medical researchers and devoted volunteers and philanthropists have done when it comes to polio. It's this far away from being wiped off the face of the earth. Four weeks ago, Fred Cook, who just sang that song, was about to have a new knee put in his leg. Here he is. His tapping with his foot is a little bit off right now. But that's always been true. <laughs> is that not a miracle? What if we talked to the people 2,000 years ago and said, well, guess what? Someone could have a brand new knee. You know, I could name 20 people right here now who had miraculous events occur in their life unheard of 2,000 years ago. It happened because of human beings claiming responsibility inspired by the Spirit for healing. And I know, I for one, and I bet more than half of us wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for human beings through medical science and research claiming responsibility for healing. And those of us who were here Maybe limp, walking with canes, unable to see, you name it. Healing absolutely happens. But it's through we people nowadays inspired by the Spirit. And it's not just about medicine. Go up to Beacon Place, 
on Monday morning or Thursday morning, there'll be about a hundred kids inside being tutored in how to read. Because of that, they'll be healed in some ways from a life that limits them. Now they'll have a fuller chance for an education and the limits start to go away. But what about what has happened in Uganda? Or what about the young men we'll hear about tonight at 6 o'clock on Channel 5 who are loved by this coach and have, as a result of this net gain program, a new and different kind of chance for life beyond that 9 by 9 block area of Austin on the north side of Chicago. That's how healing takes place in the world in the year 2017. And in so many ways, when God gave over that responsibility for healing to us, the healing that has occurred and continues to occur in the world is more dramatic and more powerful and more life-changing than ever before. Over there, and the people said, Amen. 